Meet computers. How's everybody doing today? Wow, these um, topic names are getting longer and longer as the course progresses. That's actually looking like an exponential curve, doesn't it? I hope that trend doesn't continue. How is everybody today?
Everybody's dead. Everybody's dead in the chat. Chat, press F to pay respects for the chat. Maybe it's just me. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right, we've got some apps in the chat. <sighs> I have to say, I'm digging this new low latency stream. It's uh, that's like the one thing the one thing that Teams had over YouTube, and now YouTube is superior in every category. <clears throat> um, well, let me, let me check to see if we have any announcements. Announcements. Oh, I haven't made the announcement yet about uh, that business I was talking about yesterday in class with the uh, the midterm being canceled and whatnot. Uh, probably get that done sometime today. There goes the mailman delivering the junk mail as usual. YouTube doesn't have enough good emotes though. Yes, yeah, somebody in the uh, 1MD3 class tried to get me to install something where uh, you would guys would have like a bunch of emotes that would like pop up in the in the corner of the screen down here or something and I looked at these emotes and it was just like it was it was just Pepe's like Pepe's as far as the eye could see and you know I'm not I'm not that interest like too early in the morning to be canceled you know Uh, was it BTTV? It might have been BTTV. I don't remember. I don't remember what it was. But uh, anyway. <clears throat> so, might as well continue on with what we were talking about last time. We were talking about type systems. You wish there was a Pog emote. Um, it's kind of funny. As a 90s kid, I have a completely different association with the term Pog. Are, uh, are any of you... Uh, uh, in, in, in the 90s, um, it was a schoolyard fad that you had. Uh, basically, they were really cheap to produce. It was just like cardboard discs that had been printed. And you would stack them up in a pile and you'd hit them with a metal one, and they'd fly off in all directions. And all of the ones that were like face up, you got to keep, and all of the ones that were face down, your friend got to keep, and they were like, it was like a bet. It was like, it was like schoolyard gambling. Um, that was extremely popular in the year 1997, I think. So I have a completely different association with the word pog. But yeah, anyway. <clears throat> hmm. <laughs> you could throw one at another and try to flip it. Yes. Yeah, I think they tried at one point bringing Pogs back, but it was too stupid, so they couldn't manage it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um... Yeah, I was I was never allowed to to bring my pogs to school because um, my parents understood that it was gambling and they were entirely too Christian to allow me to gamble in any form or capacity. So um, I, I I had my pog collection, which remained quite static. Uh, <laughs> kind of defeated the whole purpose. Isn't that a Squid Game thing? Oh, please, can we can we go like five seconds without somebody talking about Squid Game? Like, yeah, <laughs> remember people trying to fat, flatten their pogs? Yes. 
Anyway, let's talk about type systems. Something completely unrelated to uh, 90s fads. Although, one, one more note. I am surprised that Beyblade is still going. That genuine, like every time I realize that Bay, Bay, Bay blades are still going. I'm genuinely surprised. I would have thought they'd run out of ideas for it by now. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen it, but, uh... <laughs> oh, don't talk to me about the Yogg's cast. Bloody Yogg's cast. Ugh. I have a beef with the Yogg's cast. Which I won't talk about today. We're going to talk about type systems. So, in general, we had kind of set up very briefly the idea that we're going to take UAE, we're going to apply a type system to UAE, and our type system is primarily composed of what we call a typing relation. Um, this typing relation maps elements of our set of terms, right? The terms of our language, that is to say all programs in our language, maps all of our terms to the set of types. Because this is only UAE we're talking about, we have natural numbers and booleans as the only two elements in our set of types. Excuse me. Obviously, if you're doing a more interesting type system, um, you would have more than just naturals and booleans, but, you know, this is enough to get us started. Enough to get us reasoning formally, or shall I say rigorously. Um, uh, the, um, about types. So, um, so the, um, the typing relation itself, if you remember for our, our evaluation relation, we used arrow, right, to indicate typing relation. We are going to use colon to indicate the typing relation. So this, you know, you'll get used to it. But as I mentioned last time in class, there are actually a number of languages in which you will see colon used to designate types, and this is why. Uh, type hints in Python use colon, and Haskell uses double colon to type functions. Um, and I believe you can also use it to type regular things. Like, I believe that you can assign types mid-expression in Haskell using double colon, but uh, I, I, I can't remember if that's true or not, but I think it is. Anyway. Uh, the typing relation, and we will use the colon symbol to indicate it. So, true is typed bool, false is typed bool, and zero is typed nat. This should surprise no one. Like our operational semantics, the typing... Uh, Swift uses colons. Ah, there you go. So Swift also uses colons for type assignment. And that's probably because they read the textbook before they designed the language. Uh, as opposed to all of those uh, languages where they uh, they um, <laughs> read the textbook after they designed the language, like C. <laughs> um, anyway, so typing really type yeah you don't hear me dunking on C often, but uh, there there you go. C is just advanced assembly language. Uh, <clears throat> typing rules for Booleans. So we're going to examine the Boolean subset first, and then in a few slides we'll examine the natural numbers. So let's talk about the Booleans first, right? Um, like our operational semantics, the typing relation is defined using a set of inference rules. So you, rem you remember we had a bunch of rules that dictate how the operational semantics go, how you get, how you map one term to another term using the evaluation relation. This is the exact same thing, but we're now using types. So true is type, uh, true can be typed bool, uh, that's t true. False can be typed bool, that's t false. And this is an interesting one. For if then else, if we have 
T1 as a bool, and then T2 and T3 both typed as T, where T is the same type here, right? So if we have T1 as a bool and T2 and T3 both the same type, we can therefore conclude that the type of if then else is T. So uh, basically, what we're trying to do with this is we're trying to exclude uh, we're trying to exclude from our typing rules cases where um, we would have nonsense terms. So one of our classic examples of nonsense is if you were to use a uh, numeric value for the guard condition of, a, of an if statement. We are therefore requiring it to be a bool. That's a premise. Uh, another problem that we often run into with if statements is if the first, if T2's type and T3's type do not match, then um, you don't know whether T, whether the if statement is going to come out with one or the other, um, unless you evaluate T1, which is evaluation, and we don't want to have to evaluate in order to do the typing, in order to perform a typing analysis. So, notes on. I note the form of the rule t if. If both t2 and t3 have the same type t, then the if expression itself has t type t. If t2 and t3 are of different types, the if uh, the type of the if expression cannot be determined. This is an interesting thing. The premise t uh, the premise T1 is, uh, has type bool also tells us that the guard term must be a boolean in order for the type of the expression to be determinable. So in general, this introduces an idea that the typing relation is not total. There are terms of UAE that it is impossible, technically speaking, to derive a type for. We separate these two guys into typable or well-typed. Uh, you'll often hear the term well-typed, uh, just, just for historical reasons. And uh, you divide the well-typed terms from the untypable terms. So an, an untypable term, like the correspondence in uh, operational, like with, with respect to the semantics, the operational semantics of, um, or the evaluation semantics, of UAE is an untypable term is a bit like a normal form in that um, you can't get to a type from the term, right? With a normal form, you can't get to another term from the previous term, right? In a um, in an untypable uh, with an untypable term, you can't get from that term to an element of the typing set. The set of types. Make sense so far? Hopefully. Give me some thumbs up if this makes sense. Twenty-seven percent of the class right now is just like kind of dead. Twenty-one, ha! Ah, the yeses are winning. Okay, so so this principle of non-totality with respect to the typing relation, we should talk about that for a moment. Fundamentally, we want a type system which does not need to evaluate terms to yield useful useful information. It is impossible to tell which way the if expression will evaluate unless we evaluate T1. So, rather than forcing evaluation to determine typing, we say that such terms are not in the typing relation. Uh, this means that the typing relation is not total over the set of terms, meaning 
the domain of the typing relation is a subset of the set of terms. So you remember the difference between, like, remember, cast your brain all the way back to topic two when we were talking about, you know, the mathematical preliminaries. Remember, we were talking about the difference between partial functions and total functions. And it's that, it's that fundamental element of totality. The totality principle is for every element of the set, it is in the domain of the relation. Or in this case, or in that case, the function. So in this case, not every element of the of of t is in the domain of the of the uh, typing relation. And this is fun. This is interesting because basically we want to exclude, like we want the only things we o we want only um, terms that won't get stuck to be inside of the um, inside of the typing relation, right? So, like, that's fundamentally the goal of all of this, is to separate out those terms which are going to get stuck from those that won't. It turns out that we're actually being too conservative here. Um, there are terms that are legal and valid and will evaluate correctly that will not come up with a type under the type system we're describing. But, um, you know, for now, we're kind of, we're going to have to accept that a certain amount of good code will get thrown out with the junk. Um, let's just say that we haven't exactly separated our recyclables. So, um, I see I'm anticipating my own slides up once again. The set of untypable expressions contains, as a subset, all of the nonsense terms we are seeking to capture, such as successor of true. In other words, W is a subset of T minus the domain of the typing relation. So that's set minus. Where W, where w is the set of all terms which are syntactically correct, but contain semantic errors. This is a, this is a subset, as I mentioned, because there are some terms that would not get stuck that are going to be thrown into uh, that are going to get thrown into this um, uh, t minus the domain of this typing relation just because you know there are instances like this um, uh, like this guy at the bottom if true then false else zero this will evaluate correctly but it will not evaluate uh, it, it will not we will not be able to determine a type for it. Yes. This is the set of all terms that would evaluate to wrong under UAE in Project 1. Yes. Uh, we can't say, however, that all terms which are not well typed are the results of mit type mismatches. The following evaluates to a value, but is untypable. Right. So, so the way that languages generally speaking, um, solve this problem is they simply exclude the garbage. Uh, they, so they throw a certain amount of the baby out with the bathwater here. Um, you try to have a sufficiently good type system that, you know, anything useful or, you know, you try to you try to draw the line with the typing system as close to the sort of boundary between um, your uh, good type like your good terms and your bad terms, right? Your terms that would evaluate to a value and terms that evaluate to wrong. You try to you try to draw that line as close to uh, a, a, you try to draw the relation as close to that line as you can get without stepping over it because absolute the one thing that you absolutely want want to avoid is including wrong terms, like having wrong terms which are considered well typed, because that'll just crash your program, right? So, so that's kind of the game of type theory, is to try to push that boundary forward as close to the, the, the wrong terms as you can without actually including them. And uh, generally speaking, what most languages will do is they'll have a certain cutoff point where they where they will say 
for reasons of type robustness, we are not going to allow these, this class of constructs, despite the fact that that could technically be executed correctly. Um, a good example of this is the if then else expression inside of Haskell. Inside of Haskell, if then else, the, the, the then case and the else case inside of an if then else have to have the same type. You know, um, if you consider it mathematically, there's no reason to expect them to necessarily have the same type, but Haskell enforces that because if you don't have that, then it breaks more things later on. Basically, because, ta because Haskell requires everything to be ev type evaluate, uh, yeah, Haskell requires everything to type evaluate. So if you have an if then else there that you can't evaluate the type of, that's going to break everything past it, and that's a problem. So, uh, question. Can you please explain that subset statement again, please? W is a subset of T minus the domain of... Yes. So, first question. What is T, sub, uh, what is T set minus the domain of the typing relation? That is the way to express all terms which cannot be typed. Things like successor true, but also things like if true, then false, else zero. Anything we cannot type, that is, that's what that is. It's all terms, take away all of the terms that have types, right? The wrong values, you, you guys remember doing wrong values uh, on project one, right? These are terms whose normal form is not a value, right? Things like success or true. The wrong, like the, um, the wrong values are a subset of the untypable values. Good. I said, I, I said subset equals here because like to say it's a strict subset, I would have to prove that it's a strict subset, but yeah, uh, like all wrong things must be untypable. Yes. Um, or else your language is broken, right? Because this is a class on programming language design, right? If you uh, if you allow wrong values into your well typed into your type system, your language is broken and doesn't work. Oh, didn't know T was all terms from UAE. Yeah, so cursive T is the set of all terms. Um, we'll be using that for the set of all terms subsequently as well. So good. Um, so I know it's confusing because like cursive T is the set of terms and capital T in non-cursive is the set of types. So yeah, it's confusing and I wish that it wasn't like that, but you're just going to have to hold that in your brain. So similarly, typing rules for the natural number operations uh, are as follows. That's a grammatical mistake. So we have our new type nat, new typing rule for nat. Zero is a natural, naturally. Oh, <laughs> um, so typing rule. If T1 is of type nat, then the successor of T1 is of type nat. If T1 is of type nat, then the predecessor of T1 is also an of type nat. If T1 is a natural, then is zero T1 is a Boolean. This should be like reasonably obvious from our intuitive definitions of successor, predecessor, and is zero. Um, oh, I have a question. We want to exclude only W, but can we only exclude uh, T set minus domain, domain of typing relation, which includes things that are correct but have to be thrown out so we can have guaranteed type safety. Yes, basically, yeah. Yeah, so that's a good way to put it. Yeah, that's an unt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yes, this is an untypable sentence in English. Air trombone. Uh, <laughs> um... So, yeah, um, Pacific Cod, you're, uh, you're correct there. We want to exclude W and 
also, like, we don't want to exclude things like uh, if true, then false, else zero, because technically speaking, that could be that could be valid to evaluate, right? We don't want to exclude it, but some cases like this, we find we have to exclude it, because if we were to include this, we would also be including um, wrong values into, like, we would end up with well-typed wrong values, which is something, like, that completely defeats the purpose of having a type system in the first place. Good. Uh, seems like you guys are kind of getting it. So, I thought this was funny. Being a logician myself, you can ask my wife whether this happened on our first date. Um, anyway. <clears throat> Does Python keep expressions like that in because it's not as strictly typed? Yes. Yeah, this is, like, we're heading into the difference between, um, type, like, strictly typed languages and non-strictly typed languages. Yes. So... Actually, I think a better ex I think a better analogy here would be C, and like the ternary expression in C, which is essentially what the if then else is, right? Um, you know the C syntax for that, right? It's uh, condition question mark case one colon case two semicolon ternary expression in C. Anyway, it's the way C does if then else. Um, so C. Although C does have types in theory, uh, all, the, all the types in C do really is tell the C compiler how many bits to allocate to this, that, or the other. Uh, C doesn't care whether um, a bool like it doesn't care, you can assign a boolean to an integer, you can cast an integer as a character, doesn't, ca doesn't care, doesn't care. Uh, yes, Joe, that's the, uh, that's the syntax for ternary in C. So, in C, everything boils down to binary anyways. Uh, and, you know, this is true of computer languages in general, I suppose. Uh, but um, C does not prevent you using an integer as a, uh, as a character. <laughs> uh, is sad? Stop it. <laughs> why, why are you not a student? <laughs> Thank you, Mark. But, um, like, everything in C boils down to binary, essentially, anyway. And C is not terribly picky about you assigning, um, you know, characters to integers and vice versa, or just moving, like, anything can be anything in C. It just depends on how it's being interpreted, right? So, in that sense, in a language like C, um which is not a strictly typed language. Um, you can have expressions like this, right? You can have ternary expressions that, you know, yield an integer in one case and a, and a character in another, because C is designed from a fundamental level to just ca not care about any of that and just do everything in binary anyway. It turns out that... Um, that's one of the things that makes C and C++ very difficult to work with because it, it adds a layer of complexity uh, because it doesn't protect its own abstractions. Um, so because it doesn't protect its own abstractions, you just have to know all kinds of arcane knowledge about C and how the computer works in order to write a program effectively in C. So in Haskell, you really fundamentally do not have to care how how Haskell implements Haskell like you really don't have to you really don't have to know or care um, and that's because it's strongly statically typed and it excludes that type of that type of case but yeah anyway um, did I do this slide no I didn't so definition of the typing relation formally or perhaps rigorously, the typing relation for arithmetic expressions is the smallest binary relation between terms and types satisfying all of the type rules given in the previous section. Specifically, uh, these type rules and these type rules. Oh. 
A term t is well typed if there is some t such that t has, or a term has type t. When we talk about types, we will often make statements like, if a term of the form successor t1 has any type at all, then it has type nat. It will be handy to be able to derive the types of subterms from their containing terms, not just the type and not just type terms by their subterms. Yes. Um, as long as you do modern C++ stuff, you probably won't run into arcane legacy weirdness. Um, yes, although in C++ you can always accidentally stub your toe on it. Because um, C is a strict subset of C++. The ter and this is so this is a fun thing, right? C, the language, all of the terms of C, every possible C program is a subset of every possible C++ program. So all C programs are also valid C++ programs. So all of C's arcane weirdness as uh, as your colleague uh, terms it that's all stuff that's valid C++ code. It might cut, it might bring up compiler warnings, but you're still allowed to use it. I don't know. Maybe they. I don't know if they kept go to. Maybe they got rid of go to. That would make my statement false. But um, perhaps it has go to and it doesn't admit it in the documentation. It would be interesting to see. Um, but yeah. And you know. Yes, with C++, if you stick to, like, the C++ constructs, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to worry about all of the C stuff. But I always think that learning C is uh, the first step to learning C++. But, you know, anyway. So, um, what we want is a, note, is, a, is a way to derive the types of subterms from the type of the containing term. So, we will introduce what's called the inversion lemma. So, inversion of the typing relation. The following inversion rules are immediately derivable from our typing rules. So, if true has a type, that type is bool. If false has a type, that type is bool. If an if-then-else has a type, r, then uh, t1 is a bool, and t, uh, t2 is r, and t3 has type r. If zero has a type R, then R ha then R is natural. If the successor has a type R, then that it that R is natural and T1 is natural. And etc. etc. Predecessor um, R is natural, T1 is natural, and is zero. If is zero has a type R, R is bool, and T1 is natural. So basically, um, with this guy. We have to start with the subterms having a type, and we can conclude the uh, the type of the the aggregate term or the uh, you know the super the super term. Uh, whereas with these ones, if we start off knowing that the super term has a particular type, we can then derive the types of the subterms. This is going to be useful when we start doing proofs. What's the time? <clears throat> In the same way that our evaluation relation rules allowed us to create evaluation derivations, our typing relation rules allow us to produce typing derivations. Statements are formal assertions in the Dr. Farmer sense about the typing of programs. Typing rules are implications between statements, and derivations are deductions based on typing rules. For example, let's consider the term if is 0, 0, then 0, else predecessor of zero, uh, which is a fancy way of saying zero. This is how you would derive it. So you start with if, ze if is zero, zero, then zero, else pred zero. Remember, in order to type this term, we need to know what the type of t1 is, what the type of t2 is, and what the type of t3 is. So let's start with t1. We hypothesize t one, which is is zero zero. In order to be able to type this term, we need to know what the type of T one is. So, we um, we hypothesize zero, 
we find that it has type natural, so we know that term T1 has type natural, we can therefore conclude that is0 has type bool because of our because of our typing inference rules. Are you guys um, like getting this? This is the same way we did evaluation. This is the same as our evaluation relation. Um, we're just using it to construct web, what type th what types things have. Um, this is like I'm not necessarily going to expect you guys to be able to produce this type of proof, this style of proof. Um, this is mainly just to show you that you can get super uber formal with this uh, if you so desire, right? It's important to demonstrate that you can have a level of formality with this so that we feel more justified when we uh, deal in primarily in traditional proofs. Good. So um, with zero, we propose it as a hypothesis, find that it has uh, type natural, so we can say that T2 has type nat. And now we propose pred zero. We need to know the type of zero. We find it to be nat. We can conclude that pred zero has type nat. Um, there we go. So we know that this has type bool, this has type nat, and this has type nat. So we might we can therefore conclude that if then the if then else, which contains all of that, has type nat. We can therefore derive the type formally. Cool. Theorem: uniqueness of types. So this is this is an important theorem. Um, essentially, we are. What is it that we're establishing? Is it? Uh, Surjectivity? I forget. Um, I think it's surjective. Let me let me check for a minute. Surjective. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Theorem, uniqueness of types. Each term T has at most one type. That is, if, it, if T is well typed, then its type is unique. Additionally, there is only one derivation of this type based on our inference rules. This is essentially a, um, this, is, this is highly related to our um, theorem of determinacy with respect to evaluation. To prove the above, we would proceed via structural induction on T, break it into a case analysis, invoking the appropriate inversion formula plus the induction hypothesis in each case. Uh, we can also use induction over typing derivations to generate proofs the same way that we use induction over evaluation relations to generate proofs under UAE. So that's a kind of a lot for this slide, but um, this is a proof sketch, which is to say this is how you would go about producing the proof if you were to go to the trouble of producing it. <clears throat> and, um, you know, sometimes I'll produce a, sometimes I'll put a proof sketch in a slide and then have you do the proof for homework. That's sometimes the way things go. We can also use, so the, um, the, this guy, basically this introduces the concept that in the same way that we had induction over, over evaluation derivations, we can now also have ev uh, uh, induction over typing derivations, right? Um, both can be used. We now have a new form of induction. Any questions so far? Give me a thumbs up if you guys are following along. Still following? Um, dizzy. I don't know if that'll show up as an emoji.
Too bad I can't put like emoji emojis in this in these um in the polls. That'd be fun. <laughs> so for those of you who are um having difficulty following this. Like, it might just be because you guys are so, like, overtaxed at the moment. I, I, I hope that's the case. Because um, with respect to the typing derivation, it's not... Uh, <laughs> there we go. Can you copy and paste uni Unicode emojis? I don't know. Let's see. Maybe. I don't know. Um, so... This isn't like so by all by all means of analysis, this typing relation is not as complicated as the evaluation relation, right? Remember, with the evaluation relation, we often had several evaluation rules per term. In this case, we have precisely one um, one typing relation rule per term of the language. So if we are, if we then proceed to try to prove anything over our typing relation, we have you know that many fewer cases to worry about. Um, but it really is as simple as where the so where the evaluation relation is mapping terms to terms, the typing relation is mapping terms to types, right? Um, so, yeah, basically. Mm. So, uh, if you want to read this, uh, do it on your own time. And get off my lawn while you're at it. So, now we're going to, so, we've established these properties, right? Or we've established the semantics of the relation, right? Where where we've established how how types come into being, right? But now let's uh, let's take a look at these types and um, decide on some properties. Like in theory, you know, it's all well and good to say that. Um, the uh, the type anything that's inside of the typing relation won't go wrong, but if you've been in this class for a few period of time, you'll know that a statement like that cannot go without examination. You can't just take my word for it. We're gonna have to prove it. So, the most important property of typed arithmetic expressions or any other type system is that of safety. Uh, safety and soundness are not quite the same thing, but the text, this textbook, often will use the two terms interchangeably. And when you, so the idea of soundness as applied to a type system has a particular meaning uh, that we're going to get into, and uh, the the idea of soundness as applied to any logic system is like. It's like related, but not quite the same. It's like it, there's like a vague mismatch in the uh, in the nomenclature. Um, so in mathematical logic, that is to say, probably when you were talking in like two LC three or you know your discrete math courses from last year, when you talked about the soundness of something like propositional or predicate logic, uh, what you meant to say is it's a logical system uh, if, uh, so if predicate logic is sound, then every formula that can be proved in the system is logically valid with respect to the semantics of the system. So it's kind of a way of saying, um, if you're adhering to the grammar, you're also adhering to the semantics. Um, for us, though, we're talking about type safety. Uh, so we have a very specific definition in mind when we say that a type system is sound. Um, specifically, if a term is well typed, it can't get stuck. 
You can't have nonsense uh, inside of your typing relation. Everything that's nonsense is untypable. Uh, that is another way of saying that. Uh, another way of saying that is we reach a normal form without having reached a value. That That's what stuck means. Yeah. Um, yeah, if we reach a normal form and it's not a value, then we've reached a stuck term, and that stuck term needs to be untypable for our type system to mean anything. In general, we prove safety by demonstrating the theorems of progress and preservation. So, this theorem is composed of two sub-theorems. Number one, progress of, arith of typed arithmetic expressions. A well-typed term is not currently stuck. That is, either it is a value, or one of our evaluation rules can be applied. And when I say evaluation rules, I mean evaluation rules and not typing rules, right? That's the important thing now that we're trying to do. We're trying to relate a typed system in terms of evaluations now. So it's important to have distinguished in your head typing rules from evaluation rules. They are different things. Separate them in your brain. Our second theorem is the preservation of typed arithmetic expressions. If a well-typed term takes a step of evaluation, then the resulting term is also well-typed. So you can see that if you take both of these guys in combination, um, we, we've essentially set up the base case and the iterative case for a, an inductive argument for the soundness of our typing relation, right? Pro, um, progress is the base case. Preservation is the inductive step. Um, Taken together, we can say that any well-typed term will eventually evaluate to a value without getting stuck. We can argue this inductively over evaluation, evaluation derivations. Um, cool. Any questions about that? I don't have time to do canonical forms today, so I think we might leave it there. <laughs> Yes. Um, I mean, hey, I, I, I pride myself on having title, titles that are like, I don't know, I try to lighten the mood. You know, this stuff can get pretty dry, so it's good to, it's good to try to lighten the mood. So for those of you who are, um, like, for those of you who are, like, not quite following all of this, I assume you're kind of in the category where you can't think of a question that would aid your understanding. Um, I know it's, I know I'm, I'm demanding a lot, but, uh, if you were to come up with like, if you were to analyze why you're not understanding this and, you know, arrive at a question, I can't help you unless you ask me a question because I can't read minds. Particularly through the internet, I can't read minds. Whether or not I have any ability to read minds, I certainly do not have that ability, or perhaps an extremely reduced or diminished ability if it's through this. Yes. Oh yes, the uh, 1MD3 midterm is coming up. But that's unrelated to this class. Um, cool. No questions? No questions at all? Can I get a thumbs up at least?
I don't know. If, I feel like I get this and also don't. Lol. Yeah. Like, it's... As I was going through it, I kind of felt like the best way to conceptualize this type system is... It's like a parallel... It's like a parallel evaluation system. Um, where's the oh no panic emoji option? Yeah, well, I was just seeing if it worked, you know. It's kind of funny they like got the emoji grouped. Like there's a category face neutral skeptical. How's this one? There's still no cat jam. Coffee, yes. Yeah, I think I think the best way to conceptualize the typing system is as a um, a separate derivation. You know, it's it's like a parallel type of deri of evaluation derivation. It's very similar to the way that it, the evaluation der derivation works. It just because it's not total, that makes it int that gives it some interesting properties, right? Um, not that the not that the uh, evaluation der derivation was total either. Uh, when we implemented it in project one, we had to add a bunch of rules for reflexivity that made it total in order for it to work. Yeah. Anywho, I'm gonna log off here if there's nothing further. Um, Take her easy, folks, and uh, you'll get through it. Question. I feel like UAE and typing relation is somewhat blurry to me because in topic two or something. Um, that's not... I'm sorry, I'm going to have to reject that question as not being a well-formed question. <laughs> we learned UAE and type being two different things. Yeah, UAE and the typing over UAE are two different things, yeah. But also related. Yeah. Yeah, it's like... Let me think if I can think of a... a I can think of a good let me let me see if I can think of a good analogy for it. Um Okay. Analogy. A textbook. UAE is like the words printed on the on the on the pages of the textbook. The type system is the index and like the table of contents and the page numbers. Right? So it gives you information about what's written in the textbook. Um, it gives you information about what's written in the textbook. It allows you to use the textbook much more easily without having to actually read every page of the textbook. Um, I think that's a decent analogy. I 
Anyway, take her easy, folks. We'll talk about this again on Friday. Yay! Um... Close enough. <laughs>